Aloha, everybody. Welcome to the Hawaii Verse Podcast, a podcast that supports local by sitting in the back of trucks and trying to avoid awkward eye contact with the person in the car behind you at a stoplight. I'm your host, Kamaka Diaz, and what do you do when that happens to you? Or if you're the driver behind the truck, let us know in the YouTube comments. Before we introduce our guest, I want to remind everyone to go check out our Patreon. If you love the podcast and want to help us keep this going, please sign up for one of our five tiers. All right, let's charge into this episode and introduce our guest. Our guest today is a professional waterman from the island of Oahu. This hama is a big wave surfer, award-winning spear fisherman, free diver, and shark expert. He earned his first surf sponsorship at age 13, went pro at age 17, and has since won many big wave events like Total Santos and in 2008 won the Spearfishing World Cup. This husband and father of one is also a conservationist, skydiver, bull hunter, yoga practitioner, photographer, filmmaker, and part-time Hollywood stuntman. He has devoted his life to the sea and is one of the world's most prominent watermen. He is the past Wave of the Winter champion, and I'm stoked he's here today. His name is Mark Healy. Aloha, Mark. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Aloha. I'm good. <laughs> Happy to be here. Yes, it's good to see you slash meet you again. Um, <laughs> I think we were saying, like, I don't know if we, we met at uh, Kimmy Warner. Yeah, I uh, remember now. Shower. I mean, I had long hair. Yeah. Yeah. There was oh, a lot Was of it at the baby shower? That was the baby shower, yeah. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was, uh, had a tea leaf, and I was swatting away all the flies <laughs> at the... Okay, the, I remember, um, yes. Uh, the, the food table. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, it's good to see you again. You as well. Yes, I I follow you. Uh, I see all your videos. My brother keeps telling me I have to get you on, so now you're here. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you're watching this, Micah. <laughs> so, but you're a true jack of all trades. Like, there's pretty much nothing you don't do. Um, right? There's all kinds of things I don't do. Um, I'm not very good at hanging doors. I know that um, <laughs> in construction. <laughs> my dad tells me about that all the time, but um, yeah, I just I, I think I have uh, in a way kind of a short attention span for things, and I can't just lock into one thing. Mm-hmm. It, there's just so many shiny objects to go chase in the world, and yeah. things to learn, and uh, yeah. So I've kind of spread myself out. Yeah, but I would say you're not a jack of all trades, master of none. You're like jack of all trades, master of some. Right, I mean, some like a lot of the the water sports. Well, I, I mean, it's on a sliding scale as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. I, I, you know, it, it's hard for me to accept mastery or or the concept of mastery on so many things is because people mostly see the highlights. Mm-hmm. I see all the failures, yeah, and yeah. those that's what sticks out in my mind more more so because it happens more often. Mm-hmm. So for every win, what people don't see is there's like 25 losses behind yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I just keep coming back to the well. I guess mm-hmm. that's my my strength. Yeah. You must be really competitive and with yourself. Like you always want to yes. do better because I, I grew up playing sports all my life and, you know, I, I could have a really good game, but I'm always uh, uh, telling myself, oh, you should have done better at like, during that time. You should have done this. You shouldn't have done that. So I totally get that from that perspective. Okay. Same thing. And, and, and yeah. it's like sports or any, any pursuit I've done, like the draw has never been to beat somebody else mm-hmm. or prove that I'm better than somebody else. Even if it is like a team sport or something like that, it's just if I can know that I did my best mm-hmm. and I got better. Yeah, you know? yeah. So any like kind of like passion or like any uh, response that I have is based in that. Yeah. Whereas like some of my friends that are great competitors, they just like beating other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just get satisfaction. Yeah, you know, it's just, just like crushing people. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. All right, well, I, I do have this great idea of a TV show that I've always wanted to do in the future. Uh, I think you would be a great candidate for, for being the, the main actor. It's, it's called uh, Jack of All Trades, Master of None, mm-hmm. Chucks. So, <laughs> so basically, basically, this is my great idea. You just go around like everywhere, travel the world, mastering all these different crafts, uh-huh. whether that's surfing or you know maybe stuff that you haven't done before. And at the same time, you're also just mastering nunchucks. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> I think hey, it can work. There's there's some really bad TV shows what, out right now. <laughs> no, I'm saying like worse than your idea. <laughs> Your idea is fantastic. I I think it's got legs. Okay, cool. Well, 
I, if if I am not cut out for it, I'm gonna um, outsource it and uh, hire some people, and you're you're top of mind. So. Okay, but you <laughs> put it out there on the podcast. Now, oh yeah, no, so you can be like patent pending. Yep. We're gonna work on the copyright. <laughs> All right, so we have a million of things to get into. So uh, before we do that, I just want to know where are you from, where are you grad, and what was it like growing up? Um, <clears throat> so I'm born and raised um, on Oahu, on the North Shore. I grew up down by Velzi Land, and. Um, yeah, born Wahiwa General Hospital, been here forever, it's home. Uh, I went to a small school called Sunset Beach Christian School from kindergarten to six. I went to Kahuku for seventh. Then I was like, you know, not to, to bag on Kahuku or anything, I'm just, it's my personality type. I'm like, I feel like this is training for OCCC or something. And it's like, bell rings, go to the next classroom. Like, the, I'm... I was like, I'm learning for like an hour and a half, actual like dense trying to learn something like dense learning, mm-hmm. not me being dense, but that <laughs> could also be true. And I was like, man, I just feel like I'm wasting so much time here. And uh, I just love being in the ocean. So I was, ended up doing like correspondence and basically taught myself high school. And I would send my, my trans, transcripts and tests and everything off to junior college in the mainland mm-hmm. or on the continent, I should say. And, um, yeah, that's how I graduated. So I started hitting the road when I was like, so right around eighth grade, I started traveling a bit. So I'd take all my school books and everything and go on a lot of these trips, but who, all of them by myself or with like crews of adults, Oh, okay. you know, meet, meet people on the trip. Like I think when I was 15, I flew to India by myself and then, um, just to meet up with a bunch of Aussie crew. I remember showing up in my, Madras and being like just getting mobbed by people and beggars and I have a eight foot board bag to drag around mm-hmm. and a big suitcase and it's being like oh my gosh I'm really hosed if these people don't show up yeah, yeah. and I had to just wait around and finally I saw like the one white looking dude <laughs> in the crowd I was like oh he must be Australian <laughs> I think we're on the same trip that's funny and your parents were cool with you doing all of this yeah Aww. I was very independent from early early age i guess um yeah i think my first surf trip was to to fiji and um i think i was like 14 or something and i was i traveled solo um and when i was going through customs in the country they were like okay so what adult are you traveling with i was like oh shoot Mm -hmm. i had no idea you have to be as a minor Mm -hmm. traveling with an adult and luckily there was this this surfer guy that was on my flight from honolulu He's like, oh, he's my nephew. <laughs> and I, nice. I got in. They let me go. I was like, okay. man, thanks so much. How's it all going? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That's cool. How did you get into surfing? I, I've been surfing as long as I can remember. Mm-hmm. It's like surfing, fishing, diving with my dad. I was just like his sidekick. So he'd, mm. he'd drag me along on all of his adventures. And I grew to love all those things. Yeah. Was, was he a big wave surfer too? He, he likes surfing bigger waves. It's not like big wave surfing is what we consider now, mm-hmm. but he just, you know, he worked construction, hung out with, you know, either guys that work construction with him too or went to church mm-hmm. with him. And so they're just like blue collar surfers and they like to get away from crowds. So yeah. he goes surf places like Phantoms and stuff like that outside of Velzy Land. Um, always surfing kind of like the less perfect waves. Mm-hmm that are a bit more raw and out in the middle of nowhere. So that's, I think what like got me acclimated to bigger waves is that open ocean feel and Mm. tagging along. I guess growing up already accustomed to this, going out with your dad and I'm guessing his friends, you're probably catching what like this to you as a kid, it's like triple overhead already, right? Oh yeah. And I was a (laughs) tiny kid. (laughs) I didn't break a hundred pounds till I was 17. Wow. I was like tiny when I was in seventh grade cuckoo. There was like 200 something kids in seventh grade. I was smaller than every female in seventh grade. <laughs> well, well, we're talking about Kuku too. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I that. look like a freaking gnat. <laughs> exactly. Wow, that's great. Did, did you have a hard time fitting in? Um, I, you know, you're always, you stick out like a sore mm-hmm. thumb. Like my hair was like white blonde, mm-hmm. freckly kid and uh, just small and yeah, you you definitely stick out. Mm-hmm. You're definitely a target, yeah. um, but you learn 
they, some valuable lessons through that. Mm-hmm. What did you learn? Um, you learn how to be less of a target, <laughs> how to be the least easy option, and how to read people and mm-hmm. read a room and read a situation mm-hmm. and know when either somebody's trying to put you in a leveraged bad position or, you know, when, it, which was the funniest thing. It'd be like, I, I didn't realize that, like, I knew there's levels of people's awareness mm-hmm. to, like, your environment mm-hmm. and the crowd and everything. But it wasn't until I had friends that would come over from California um, to come surf in Hawaii and do some contests as kids. Uh, and I would take them out and, you know, we'd go end up going to parties and stuff and and just be like, hey, boys, time to go. It's getting late. The dynamic's changing here. Mm-hmm. And they just were, like, utterly unaware. Mm. Like, wait, were you, like, born without an instinct? <laughs> or, like, how do you... <laughs> like? Yeah. How do you not see what's about to happen here? You are about to get punched in the face. <laughs> I need to get you out of here ASAP. I'm like, oh, what are you talking about, man? I'm just having a good time. Everyone like, loves us. Yeah. <laughs> God. They keep looking at us. Yeah. They love keep, us so much. Keep pointing over here. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's, but that's I so guess funny. those are the lessons in a general and broad way that yeah. you get to learn. That's so funny you say that because I noticed that so much with like people well because we're both born and raised here so yeah there's a different level of awareness that you have to have culturally socially all of that you know just to be able to navigate this this world right yeah and people would come in um visit. and you don't realize it a lot of time until, until people visit yeah, and or you're you like leave there's a lot I, yeah. of like unspoken protocol mm-hmm. and things it's a respect-based yeah. culture and mm-hmm. you know there's differences yeah as small as just taking off your slippers in the house greeting people mm-hmm. like one time um i was at my neighbor's house and they had family visiting from outside of Hawaii. i, I forget where what state and <laughs> i go i hear the doorbell ring and i open the door and i was like hey what's up and they just walk in they don't even <laughs> say hi <laughs> i'm like wait what it's <laughs> like I, I was like oh these people are definitely not from here because yeah. you don't do that over here well i feel <laughs> like um hawaii is less anonymous I feel like there's a certain sense in a lot of places and it, it, a lot of rural places on the continent are, are very similar to Hawaii. And mm-hmm. I feel like I fall right into that. But um, I think there's a lot of places where people almost just assume and, and they're used to having interactions with people and being like, I'll never see this person mm, again. Yeah. Whereas Hawaii, That's I think it's point. always like, we're going to see each other again. Yeah, exactly. We know there's one degree of separation or less mm-hmm. most likely between me and anybody that yeah. we run into, you know? That's true. Especially growing up in a small town, like you don't, at least for the most part, you don't try to act up because, you know, you're going to know somebody's auntie, uncle, cousin, brother, sister. So you don't want to do anybody wrong. That's why yeah. the relationships you have here, the connections are so important. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm I'm curious because of um, that high level of EQ that you had um, just growing up, uh, just from the seventh grade, just going to Coco, do you think that helped you with understanding other things like the ocean or like being aware of yourself in certain situations? Like even surfing, like, okay, maybe um, like your your senses are more heightened. Like, okay, I have to, I'm in a bad position on this wave. I'm going to have to, you know, step up, go back, whatever. Do you think that helped you? I think it's the other way around. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Got it, yeah. I think, um, um, you know, it's not just like Coco. you know, Coco is, I had fun, mm-hmm. and uh, this yeah, life yeah, it's 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 that, but it's just mm-hmm. general life, mm-hmm. you know. Growing up in Hawaii, sticking mm-hmm. out like a sore thumb, <laughs> um, but uh, it's very uh, the the lesson lessons you learn in nature and in harsh environments and with the animals that you know, like sharks and stuff like that. There, there's certain realities there. All the fluff is gone. You know, so you can kind of realize and not talk yourself out of like the reality of certain situations because you've experienced that so many times. It's like you don't you don't think nature is a Disney movie because mm. you've experienced it and you know there's real re- repercussions for not being attentive and not reading the environment and everything. And I think uh, just that that mental mechanism of not I feel like people really talk themselves out of of uh of things a lot like it, it's amazing like no instinct at all mm-hmm. like, okay things are going real bad but maybe i'll 
pull out my iPhone. There, there's <laughs> there's shooting going on. I'm like, maybe I'll film this. Like, no, get down, dummy. <laughs> like, this isn't a TV show. This is real life. It's happening right yeah, now. Yeah. Like, there's this cognitive dissonance mm-hmm. between that. And when you're dealing with nature that doesn't give a damn about you, mm-hmm. um, you learn to not have that cognitive dissonance, I guess. Mm. And and I think you grew up in a time where there was no social media, you know. Thank phones God. weren't really a thing because the fir- your first reaction was like say you see a a boar, it's not like oh hold on let me Instagram this let me Snapchat <laughs> this to my friend right it's like yeah okay whatever weapon you have bull gun whatever let's let's get ready or maybe you don't have anything run away or something like that right mm-hmm. so that yeah that that's super interesting um, yeah I see videos on Instagram just like. A volcano erupting or something and people are just like yeah recording. i think i saw the same one yeah and then they're like is it gonna come near us that's exactly yes. what i'm talking about yeah. i would be like <laughs> running downhill like trying to yeah. get behind something and get some yeah. cover or at least do it uh, a little bit more tactically like maybe turn it to the selfie camera <laughs> run <laughs> and then have it behind you right <laughs> so just you know stuff like that yeah yeah <laughs> exactly. I, I totally get it. Do you do you ever get scared, or do, do you feel like you just kind of miss that that um, fear gene just missed you because you grew up in all these crazy situations? No. Yeah. I. I. You don't get get scared too. I guess I. But it's the way you file. I feel like there's a lot of different flavors of scared, mm-hmm. and this is where um um I think the English language is super limited. We have these, you know, if. For instance, Hawaiian is mm-hmm. like, I remember being told that there's like, you know, teens, like 14 or 17 different words for gray. It's very specific. Mm-hmm. Whereas English is is not very specific. And fear, for such an important word, there's not a lot of variations around that. Mm-hmm. So yes, like, I, I'm like, okay, this can go really bad. And things aren't looking so hot for me right now. I might get seriously injured or somebody else might. Um, but I'm not, when I think of fear, I think of like an uncontrolled panic mm. of the mind or the, at worst, it's mind and body. But I, I guess I've, I've been able to operate in those situations and I get a bit more focused. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when I can, I double down. What I like to say is you're, you're taking a poem and turning it into a math problem. So I pull the emotion out of the situation and I'm just nuts and bolts focused on what's in front of me. Mm-hmm. And I've been able to compartmentalize well. Nice. Yeah. I, so, I'm similar. Yeah. So it like fear, yeah, mm-hmm. gets scared a lot in that stuff. But it's like, what's my definition of fear compared to the listeners? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think compartmentalizing is super important in, uh, all aspects of life. I mean, it's a good thing and bad thing. Depends yeah, how it's a double-edged right? sword for yes, sure. Yes, exactly. But uh, taking emotion out of how you react to things is things are um, is so important because when you react react emotionally, you think irrationally. Yes. And all logic goes out the window. All your you know. We've it, watched it for yeah. what two three years now. <laughs> exactly. At a mass scale. Yes, exactly. Uh, Fear mongering. So, yeah. You know, this, crazy scare tactics. People will do anything yeah. when they're scared. Yeah. I know that it was crazy to see stuff like that on mainstream media, like the news. I remember seeing a COVID commercial where I, I had no idea it was a COVID commercial at, at the beginning of it because it started off with this like young girl walking down the street. It was this almost black and white, like very gloomy. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's coming for everybody. <laughs> Ooh. And something, something. And then like, it, and it ends up being like COVID's here. Like get your vaccine. I was like, oh, I did not expect that. <laughs> That's crazy. I'm going to try not to cuss on this podcast. Oh, no, like, no, you can. No, we, we have those no people can fuck right yeah. off <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. It's like the manipulation and, oh, man, it's it's just crazy. Yeah. We could obviously could go down a rabbit hole on that. Um, but regardless of where anybody stands on that stuff, if you haven't recognized and observed how people act on mass when they're afraid mm-hmm. during this process, then you really missed out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that um, has to do with the awareness um, mm-hmm. aspect of things. I think, uh, especially if you if you've seen situations similar to it, you're you're more um, attuned to like noticing those things. Yeah, because um, like I I right before the pandemic came um, happened, I was in Madagascar. I, I lived in Madagascar for three years, super corrupt place. 
Oh, wow. Um, I was in the Peace Corps, so I was volunteering there. Um, also, someplace you should definitely I've been, I've visit. almost gone like three times. <laughs> yeah, okay. So whenever you want to go, let me know. I'll give you some good suggestions. Um, awesome. Yeah, uh, a lot of corruption, a lot of this sketchy things, you know, just like I worked for a community health organization over there mm -hmm. during my third year. And uh, there was a measles outbreak and a lot of overreporting uh, of numbers and like just um, just to get more aid, you know, yeah. for hospitals, for different regions. So, you know, seeing a lot of... Uh, similarities in a corrupt country, a developing country, um, compared to a developed country, it was, it was really very, it was very unsettling. I've, I've yeah. spent a lot of time, mm -hmm. you know, out of country and in yeah. developing countries and very corrupt places. I've like essentially like run, have done business in those places. Mm -hmm. You know, I know how the game goes, mm -hmm. but it's really interesting when you come back, it's, it, now that I'm older and I have more experience under my belt, you're just like, we're just as corrupt. It's just hidden better. Exactly. Yeah. We just put this as like plaster <laughs> over it. It's just as corrupt. Yeah. It's, it's almost worse. Yeah. And they, I, they're just a disorganized corrupt. Mm -hmm. This is an organized corrupt. Yeah. So if something, if there's, there's something negative like corruption, I'd rather have it disorganized than organized. Because mm, it's more obvious. Yeah, well, and, and it's more efficient and effective, mm. the corruption. For all the propaganda, too. Yeah, yeah. it's a machine. Yeah. I, I first learned about the word propaganda when I was living in Madagascar because uh, I was there during election season, mm -hmm. and then there's a lot of civil unrest. <laughs> yeah, they, like, they use the word propaganda as well, but as like, because of the French word propaganda. They use oh, it. is it a French word? Uh, I think so because propaganda. Uh, I don't yeah. know. How you'd say Propa that. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's a French word. Propaganda. Uh, <laughs> propaganda. <laughs> propaganda. Propaganda. Uh. Yeah. Um, community Roman Catholic something. Pope George French word. Oh, r random fact. Uh, when I was in Madagascar, the Pope w um, visited. Oh, really? In Madagascar. One time I saw him just walk, walk into work one day, and then there's a bunch of cars just um, lined up, people all on the sidewalk, and then the car drives past. I'm like, oh, that's the Pope. Is he picking up a paycheck? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think uh, they, uh, they, he does his visits, and um, because it's a um, Francophone country, uh -huh. um, the, he went to Madagascar. So, yeah. French translation. Uh, propaganda. Ah, okay, I don't know. Well, Anyways, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound that French to me. Yeah, maybe they know. just used it and I thought it was French. It's one of those things. That's why you got to do your research. <laughs> Not believe everything. I just like throwing stuff out there and acting like I know what I'm talking about. It's confidence. Yeah, yeah. That's what you gotta it's, do. it's all in the delivery. Yeah. How likely is somebody to Google what I yeah, say right exactly. now? Exactly. <laughs> Hey, that, that's, what, that's a good right. business tactic. <laughs> no, I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> All right. Well, going, going back to the, you know, big wave surfing, you know, hunting, you, you do a lot of things that require this type of mentality, you know, to, to really take yourself to the next level, get yourself in the right mindset to, to do these things. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it has to do with being uncomfortable, right? So I'm, I'm guessing that you just live or you're just comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Well, no, because, well, I, I've done it enough, and I think this is the key to it, and why, like, I promote people, like, challenging themselves and becoming uncomfortable. Because, you know, that, that bar might be different for different people. But the whole point is you get uncomfortable. You put yourself in a place where you have to perform, perform from a mental or physical aspect, and you will be amazed if you st stick to it like what can come from it? What kind of growth? You can do things that you never thought you could before, but you have to kind of like prime the pump. You have to, you have to have small wins that build up. So you know that there's like light at the end of the tunnel and that keeps you going. So it kind of builds on itself. Like, well, I remember a week ago I was doing this and it was really hard. I didn't think I could pull it off, dug deep, pulled it off. So now I'm doing this thing. It's like, where is my limit? I'm going to have to find out. Mm -hmm. I think that's the cool thing about surfing. It's, it's mm -hmm. such a progressive sport. And you, you, you can feel the improvement as you go on. Yep. Yeah. Maybe because you started really young. So I guess it was, maybe you don't, didn't notice it as much. But I, I started surfing as an adult. Mm -hmm. So and in playing sports all my life, being athletic, it's so frustrating when you're not good at something. 
when you start something. Like, I uh, hate sucking at things. Yeah, like uh, it makes bull me hunting, crazy. right? Didn't you, you started hunting as an adult, right? Yes. Hunt, so yeah. I've been hunting like 12 years, maybe. Yeah. I'm 40 now. Yeah. So, so doing that as an adult when you're just like, you kind of already have some, some level of mastery or just like competence at some mm-hmm. things in life. Then when you're starting all over again, you're just like, first, the social pressure of just looking good, especially with surfing. You know, I longboard. Mm-hmm. So I'm just like, oh, like that, that their learning curve is a little hard. But plus, you got to deal with the It's crowd like learning and... how to foil in a public place <laughs> exactly, with all your friends watching. Exactly, yeah. Nobody looks good learning <laughs> how to foil. Yeah. And then finally getting like, you know, having those little wins where you're mm-hmm. just like, oh, I stood up. Oh, I turned. Oh, now now I'm looking at the wave differently. Oh, I'm reading the wave. I'm in a better position. Oh, I just walked to the nose, but I fell off. Okay, now I stayed at the nose. So stuff like that, it, it's so fun. That's what I love about surfing. Mm-hmm. And um, But for big wave surfing, that's nuts, first of all. <laughs> well, it's it gets tricky at a certain point because you're like building. You're having that, that incremental pros- mm-hmm. progress, and uh, you hit a certain point to where all of a sudden, like, to go to the next level, it's like a weather event that doesn't happen that often. Yeah, yeah. you know, you're it's like, a huge I want to be better. I want more. I love doing this, and it happens like twice a winter in Hawaii. Yeah, and like sometimes once anything you you're used to surfing. Yeah, <laughs> so it's like because you're like, okay, I've surfed twenty foot waves, surf big waves, and I want to surf bigger ones now. And you could wait like two years. Yeah, unless you hit the road and travel. Mm. You chase winter around the world and go to the southern hemisphere during yeah. our summer, yeah. and then you get the exposure. So that was like the impetus to really chase big waves and explore and go find new ones in different places in the world. Is because otherwise I'd just be sitting on my thumbs and not getting the the progress out of myself that I want. Because mm-hmm. it's it's so much about exposure and experience with that. Yeah, yeah. How how do you go from like like to, to that next level, is it is it all just relative? Like you, if you can catch a wave, you can catch and like whether that's you know a five foot wave or a forty foot wave. What's what's the difference? Like because honestly, a big I'll, difference. I'll, I will. Well, first of all, <laughs> I will never ever catch a forty foot wave. Like I don't want to die. It looks fun. Like you know, I don't think the the risk reward is worth it for me at, at this point of my life. Um, but like I don't know how I would even practice for that. You know because. Like the gap between like a little like the biggest wave in town mm-hmm. compared to like something at Waimea or anywhere else in the world is just how do you practice for that? It's you just had it's exposure. <laughs> yeah. It's coming back, and that's why it's so intimidating that you have to have multiple chances because you're going to be intimidated, and that's the last thing, last mindset that you want to have coming into it because you have to be a hundred percent commitment. Like all systems go full send because I mean. As the, the waves get larger, the swells get bigger, It's waves are moving way faster. They have exponentially more volume. Um, <clears throat> so usually, say like a big day at Jaws, those waves are moving around, just a swell coming in, it's moving around 25 knots, so mm. a little more than 25 miles an hour. Um, a little more, a little less. Somebody's going to check me on that one. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's it's moving fast. It's very intimidating. I, I'd liken it to if if you've ever been very close, like to an elite class athlete in a sport that you enjoy. It almost be like you know if you you hit the gym, do some training, like some stand up or some jujitsu, and then you know a uh, elite level. UFC guy comes and just starts toying with people and you're like, oh, there's like... That's the gap right there. There's a giant mm-hmm. gap between me and this guy or um, or seeing some kind of high-level event in person. Mm-hmm. And for the first time, you're like, oh, this is all happening at a completely different speed that I don't even... A, my body isn't physically capable at the moment to do this. B, I don't even think my brain can process mm-hmm. how fast things are going. Mm-hmm. Like... It's like taking a little league kid and having a a professional baseball player mm-hmm. throw a pitch at him. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the difference to me from small waves to big waves, mm-hmm. and um, it it really is a mental hurdle. Like, look at me; I'm not anywhere near like the top <laughs> three hundred surfers from a technical perspective. Probably, I'm like 
I'm at like the bottom thousand on Earth. Um, but a thousand though, that's good. <laughs> out of who si- knows? Seven billion, eight billion people. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> right on. <laughs> but um, but I I've I was able to reach a, a, a high level in big wave surfing. Mm-hmm. It's not because I'm the most technically talented. Like I'm, I was willing to go back and I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of really good surfers that aren't good big wave surfers, and that's for a reason. Mm-hmm. It's getting past that mental aspect of it and mm-hmm. being okay with. You know, falling, <laughs> potentially dying. <laughs> yeah, I know. I saw that huge wave at uh, Na- Nazareth. Is that yeah. Nazareth? Um, it was like hundred foot wave or something. Mm-hmm. Oh, just watching that was just giving, like, making my heart race. If you fall, you're dead, right? No, really, no. But it's you know, something bad might happen. You're definitely going to go to a very dark mental and physical place for a while. How do you survive that? <laughs> it's that's the thing about. Waves, it's so chaotic. Um, you know, you and me, the distance we are across this table right now, we could go both get caught inside by, by that wave and have a totally different experience. One of us could get washed in like 50 yards and the other person's like 200 yards. Mm. It's the chaos. It's, it's just a roll of the dice every time. You don't know which ones are going to uh, be the nasty one. Mm. But so- you played the game long enough. You're gonna get nasty ones. Definitely. So how do you like what are you telling yourself when you, you know, have a big wipe out, you get held you hold, um held under like maybe a couple of waves? Like what where do you go in your mind to get through that? And also, what is your the, the longest you can hold your breath for? <laughs> it's um <clears throat> I go I just try to go completely inward, basically, and and just focus on calming my mind. I'm using a mental mechanism that I've found through putting myself in very extreme discomfort willingly in a controlled environment. So that's where you find those things that work for you mentally. Now I'm using it. But it could be, I've found that I kind of flip through the channels to see what's working for me that day, depending on how I feel, what mood I was in that day. You know, sometimes I could be imagining that I'm in like a mosh pit. So I'm like, yeah, I like this, like this violence and this movement. And other times, you know, I'm going like way deep meditating basically. Um, Or just uh, really like hyper-focusing on uh, uh, sensation. Like I'm just going to focus on how the water feels on the top of my right hand. Mm. And I'll just go there. Um, but it's different mechanisms for different people. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's just your, your biggest foe would be panic. Mm -hmm. You cannot let panic start Mm -hmm. because once that, you know, that bird gets out of the cage, it's hard to put back in. Yeah. I've panicked once at, uh, um, being held down at sunset. Yeah. Bad idea. (laughs) That was the closest I've ever got to drowning because I, I broke a board, Mm -hmm. um, and it was, I didn't uh, fall off the wave. Uh, it was when I was going back out, a wave broke over me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did, I was still kind of early on. So I didn't really know how to, that's one aspect of surfing you kind of disregard is how to get past waves. Yep. You know, you're so focused on surfing the wave. Um, you kind of forget like, um, how to like, what would I do when this big wave is coming? How do I get out? Um, and I was used to surfing town waves, right? I, I, mm-hmm. I learned in town. So it was my first time surfing North Shore and it was actually like pretty big. Um, and then I remember getting, I got hit, um, the, came up, the board was broken and I, I was like, okay, what do I do? I'm like far out. Right. And I was kind of starting to, you know, panic a little bit. Uh, I, another wave comes, I tried to hold on to half the board, bad idea. Cause it like cut me. Yep. Um, I should just went down. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I was like being tossed around. The leash was wrapping around my body. And uh, so I was like, you know, staying calm because I've been in situations like that. And I always hear people just say, stay calm, right? Mm-hmm. And I was getting, I was already tired because there's the second set um, or second wave. And uh, I was just like, hey, I think I'm at a good, good point where I can start paddling up. So I started paddling up, but I didn't realize how deep I was underwater. Because mm-hmm. usually in town, I'm like already, like I could feel like the reef or, you know, it's not that deep. And I was going like this. And I was like, okay, I'm not at the top yet. I'm not at the top. And then I started to panic and flutter. And yep. then I just made it up just so I could. <gasps> and then I was like, my boy broke. But mm-hmm. by the time that happened, the, the set stopped. So I was like, thank God. <laughs> yeah. 
That's a, that's always like the question too, is like, do it. When do I use my energy reserve to try to break for the surface? Because I, if I break now, maybe I'll get a breath before the next one. Mm -hmm. If it's going to be a two wave hold down or do I just stay and chill and accept it, but then maybe it's an unnecessary two wave hold down to me. That's the hardest one to wrap mm -hmm. your, your brain around because you're trying to, you know, be in this almost meditative state to conserve energy and st keep panic away, but you're still having to do these calculations and you have to stick to the plan once you've, there, it, it, there's a certain point of no return mm -hmm. that happens with all these little steps in the process. So you got to commit to it. Yeah. I can see how that can relate to a lot of different sports too. Cause now that I think about it, when I think of a, a boxer or UFC fighters, when they have, they're going with a game plan, they know what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And at some point you get flustered and you're just like, Swinging, throwing Kalapana, there's like these haymakers <laughs> everywhere. And I haven't like, heard that one in a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, glad you, I, as I said that, I was like, oh, I think that's a big island thing. But, uh, yeah, I've heard yeah. that. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then it, the game plan just goes out the window. You start to panic, you get flustered, you think emotionally. Yep. Um, and that's usually, it usually doesn't end end well. But. No, it doesn't. And, and it's so easy to sit here and talk about it and act like, oh yeah, I want to do that. Like, <laughs> man, it's, it's difficult for a reason. Yeah, like it, it's easy to to lose the plot when mm -hmm. you're under that much duress. Yeah, what what's the longest you've ever been held down? I'm not sure. Um, I wouldn't know because I yeah yeah you're not like really you know. <laughs> but uh, Five seconds, six seconds. I tell you, a minute is a long time, a long you've time. Been held down for a minute? Maybe. I don't know. I'm I'm like I'm on Mars when yeah. I'm. I've already gone to my little mental happy place that I'm trying to, I'm trying to work on some stuff in there. <laughs> it could be an hour. It could have been 20 seconds. I don't know. Um, but, uh, I would, I mean, like I have footage from Mavericks and this contest that I did over there just started off the heat by getting caught inside by a set and getting a two wave hold down and two wave hold down. It, I, that was a long hold down and it was only like 47 seconds. Only. But, like, we can all hold our breath for that long. To me, like, the equivalent as far as how difficult it is, like, a one-minute hold down would be equivalent to, like, a six-minute breath hold. Mm. Yeah, because your, your heart's pumping. You're doing everything yeah. wrong for an effective breath hold. Mm -hmm. You got adrenaline spiked. You have max cardio output because you just paddled, like, a sprint to catch the wave. Um, it's chaotic. It's loud. It's dark. It's cold. Like there's all these factors that just make it yeah. the worst scenarios for an efficient breath hold. So you're, yeah, you're you're working against nature on that one. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Well, um, so when you're not surfing, what is the longest you you hold your breath? Like probably around six minutes. Yeah, I did like a, I think I did a six ten hungover one day <laughs> just when we were with a bunch of people holding breath. Like, I don't even, I don't know, I don't know how long I could hold my breath, honestly. What's the world record, do you know? Um, something obscene. Over 10 minutes. No way. Oh, yeah. 10 minutes? But you have to specify whether it's a world record based on breathing up on pure O2 beforehand mm -hmm. or not, because that makes a huge difference. Okay, this is crazy. 24 minutes, 37 seconds. Longest time breath held voluntarily. Guaranteed. Some guy breathed up on O2. 100%. Okay. So but there's, I, there's it doesn't even matter. That's obscene. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. That, that's that's crazy. I think the longest I've held my breath for was like in a pool for a minute. <laughs> Growing up, you know, yeah. you just like try to do it and you have somebody time you. Or you try to swim to the other Which end is of the super pool. dangerous. I, like PSA on this one. Don't hold your breath in any kind of water unless you have like a person who knows what they're doing, eyes on you 100% mm -hmm. the whole time. Like so many people die in pools blacking really? out. I'd be dead if I didn't have uh, friends helping me. But of course, I have my dive buddies, you know, in four foot deep pools. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I'm going to push it really hard. I'm probably going to black out. Next thing I know, I wake up on the deck. Huh? Wow. So that's, you know? that's But how once you, you lose control, you're done. Yeah. So don't do it alone. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Okay, and because you, you're a free diver, spear fisherman, mm -hmm. you got to 
practice those things too. So it, it all helps out with the surfing. Everything's yes. related. Um, so what is the training? Like how does somebody train to hold their breath like that? Um, I mean, y- there's pool exercises. To me, the best start is to start working on um, like rib cage and gut flexibility and working on that lung volume there. Um, doing a warm up every time before night and day difference. Mm. So, so many people think that they can't hold their breath that long because somebody's like, okay, now hold your breath. Like nobody on the planet, their first breath hold is the best one. Mm -hmm. You got to get your body acclimated, like Mm -hmm. to know like, Hey, this is what we're doing. We're going to deal with some CO2 here. Mm -hmm. So warm ups are a big deal with performance. But, um, I always say like just not being tight, doing that stretching with your gut cavity and also your rib cage. Um, because if you think of your lungs like a balloon in a bird cage, you can only blow that balloon up so big because the mm. bird cage is holding it. The bird cage eventually has to get bigger. Mm-hmm. So that means your ribs need to be able to expand out. And just as importantly, um, your guts need to be able to drop, mm-hmm. drop down because that lower lung area is where most of the volume is. So mm-hmm. it's got to be able to, it can only expand out sideways so much. It's got to be able to expand down as well. Mm-hmm. So flexibility is a big one. So it's just like breathing exercises? Like, yeah. Like, or like, yoga? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Dang. And so how, what, what are your um, physical and mental practices like <clears throat> to, to get you in the top shape? Give us all the the tips. I, you know what, you know, there's like cardio training, there's flexibility a lot. I should do more strength. I never really have, um, but I've just always focused on like cardio and Mm -hmm. and flexibility, like mobility, things like that. Um, But to me, yeah, it's a mix of a lot of different things. It's, uh, it's doing, you know, fill in the blank on, on cardio flexibility what I like, I think that gets me in the best shape specifically for big waves is being doing anaerobic workouts. So you're doing workouts while you're holding your breath. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're getting used to the O2, um, you, that fatigue, dealing with that lactic acid, and then doing it in situations where you don't get to control the cadence of your breathing. So you have like disrupted breathing patterns mm-hmm. because we can do all the optimal breathing exercises that we want. And this, this I think is a really big missing piece of the puzzle that I don't hear people talking about is, um, yeah, which is fantastic. But in big wave surfing, it's a very uncontrolled environment. You don't get to pick when you get to breathe and Mm -hmm. necessarily even how deep you get to breathe in those situations. So being able to actively recover and figure out how to like body surfing, Mm -hmm. Like if I want to get in good shape, I'll body surf a lot. Mm-hmm. I got surf pipeline in the morning, head out, body surf for a couple hours. Um, because it's a disrupted breathing pattern. Um, you get used to creating like micro breathing patterns. So it's like, okay, I'm not going to be breathing the same when I'm swimming back out to the lineup as if I'm caught inside and I know I got a wave hit me in the next 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. Like knowing the most effective patterns for different periods of time to use. Mm. I think that's been a big help for me. And I've always kind of focused on that. Mm. That's something I should do. My friend was telling me, yeah, if I want to get in good shape, go body surfing or mm-hmm. just even uh, understand the waves a little, little bit more. Yep. Yeah. Have you ever surfed in a live board? I think I maybe tried like once at like a teeny sandbar. I want to, mm-hmm. I want to get one though. It yeah, looks yeah. fun. I, I've so written off like me getting better at small waves at this point. <laughs> I just want to have fun. Just w- one size. That's all. Just, I just want to have fun in smaller waves. <laughs> <laughs> I have fun in smaller waves. I'm like, I'm at the point where um, if it's too big, I, I get a little annoyed because it just, it closes out a lot. Town doesn't really hold. Yep. But I'm not at the point where I want to surf North Shore, you know? So it's like, I think like waist to chest high is, is fun. Yeah, I love it. I I like taking a longboard yeah. <laughs> out and stuff like that. At least I'm not like mad at myself because I'm so terrible. And it's like big surprise. You didn't get better at small wave surfing. You're 40 years old, bro. <laughs> like, just have fun. Don't take it seriously. Yeah. Do you take any supplements or anything like to? Get yep. You- so, 
so like my every morning routine right now is um, I'll take um, uh, a B12, D3, K2 tincture of vitamins. Um, so that's a methylated uh, B12. And that's from Protect, a company I'm a co-founder of. Nice. Um, I take the Clarity from Protect, again, mm-hmm. product that we make. Um, and that's... Uh, not, not an advertisement. Yeah. We'll go buy it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's primarily Lion's Mane, so to get my brain working. And I love it. I feel a difference. About 45 minutes after I take it, I can I get a lot better at multitasking. Um, I'm taking fish oil, uh, omegas, and then... Uh, oh, God, what... I'm brain farting right now. Oh, I should have took more. Um, <laughs> what's the one from Kona where they... Uh, oh, Bioastin. Bioastin, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, Bioastin. I've been nice. taking that just for like skin and stuff okay. like that, which it's totally... It's actually like... I, they don't pay me. They don't give me stuff yeah. or anything, but it's pretty interesting because like if I do get fried, you know, like don't put sunscreen on my arms and end up being out way longer in the sun than I thought, like the sunburn goes away. No by way. the next day. It doesn't stay huh. since I've taken it. I've never had I always see it, but I'm a little skeptical on some supplements. I mean, I take B12. Oh, me too. I yeah. take um, zinc and um, mm-hmm. what is it? Uh, krill oil. I take krill oil over fish oil. Okay. Yeah. What's, just, it, what's the thought process behind that? Uh, because I, I, one, it doesn't have the, like, the fishy taste. I think it's a little, um, and it's a little different. It's similar with the omega-3s, mm-hmm. I think, but um, basically you're just taking like the like the best part from the that krill, I think it's well. Different. It's yeah, it's a foundation of the food chain. Any of the yeah. fish are getting that yeah. eventually passed up to them. I just have like a kind of a minor shellfish allergy, so I wonder mm. if it just like creates some inflammation. Oh, okay. Maybe. Yeah, I was wondering because it it sounded like krill is a little bit more expensive, but a little bit more effective. That's but that uh, you could read any article and it would yeah, say other things exactly. about it, right? It's so tough so these days. I just decided to go with krill over omega because I used to take. Uh, fish oil. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, so yeah, I don't know. I've just been taking it recently, but bioastin is something that um, I see see all the time. Should, we should uh, get them to send us some product and we can show yeah. the <laughs> podcast. But hey, that's, sponsor podcast, yeah, guys. Come yeah. on. And he's been he's been sh- like using your product for so long. Send send Mark's free <laughs> product. What's going on, bioastin? <laughs> Come on. That's why Kona Kona's a junk side. He lo he looks like better. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, nah. <laughs> That's yeah. So I'm gonna try that. I'm gonna try every time I get sunburned because I usually wear sunscreen. Sometimes I, I just wear a shirt or I forget. Yeah. Um. But recently I've been rubbing off my sunscreen. I've been wearing Vertra or like this Almavara sunscreen, and I don't know why I've just been like rubbing my face a lot. So and I've been staying out for a long time. So I've been getting really sunburned. So. Yeah, the the hardest thing for me, like we make a sunscreen too, which I love, oh, but nice. there are certain things that you can't get around and like diving is one of them mm-hmm. in that if you put a mask on it, it's going to take oh, the sunscreen yeah. off where the mask is and you're equalizing and pinching your nose in that mask so it takes the sunscreen off your nose. Mm. And then you get on the boat and you go, or the ski or whatever, and you go in between dive spots and that's like middle of the day, it's like 10, 15 minutes. You don't spend the time to put more sunscreen mm-hmm. on. You do that a few times, and then you get burned. <laughs> yeah, oh, but th- that's a cool life hack, the boss. And we're gonna I'm gonna try that out. All right, so um, let's get into Instagram questions real quick, mm-hmm. and then we'll, I got some more questions for you. All right, Cachalorisquez. It's a hard one to say. Cachalorisquez wants to know favorite big wave spot. Um, mm, I mean. Big cloud break is really hard to beat in oh, Fiji. Fiji? Yeah. What's so good about it? It's a, it's a left. I'm goofy foot, so nice. I like, you know, I prefer to be front side on a 25-foot wave. <laughs> That'd be nice. Yeah, I understand that. I don't like jaws. It's just like, oh, God, here we go. Just going to get a caning. Yeah, my backside is so weak. <laughs> I always grab rail when I have to uh, go right. <laughs> no shame in that. Um, yeah, and it's just, it's an open ocean, powerful reef break that's just kind of, that's like home for me, you know. That's what okay. I'm accustomed to. Fiji, when's the last time you've been there? God, Fiji got closed for like two, two and a half years mm-hmm. during this whole shenanigans. Um, but they just opened up, and I'm trying to find any excuse to go down <laughs> there with the family and nice. and go spend some time. That'd be awesome. I haven't been there, but would love to go there. Yeah. You ever uh, heard about the the surfing Madagascar? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that why it was on, on your radar? Yeah, I, I got some it. buddies in. Mm. They've they've been there. 
then okay. ex- kind of found some stuff over there. Yeah. Did they like it? What did they say about it? Because only from when I was there. Well, I they bought it. land, so oh, they okay. must have liked they, it a How bit. did they buy land? Where, are they know. married to someone? Because it's one nope. of those those places where you can't buy land unless you're from there. Like, Well, it's probably, I mean, Mexico is a little bit similar. Like you usually have to have like mm. a, use a Mexican citizen as like a pass-through yeah. entity and there's a, you know, a potential risk on mm. that end because they can be like, hey, thanks for the land. See ya. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if it was a situation like that. Mm. Okay, I see that. Uh, a lot, there's a lot of French guys that move there, like old rich French guys marry mm-hmm. young Malagasy girls, open up a restaurant or get yeah. some sort of land. So, Typical expat story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> All right. So Tunnelman underscore wants to know, what's the biggest wave you've ever caught? Biggest wave I ever caught? Um, gosh, I don't even know. Um, paddled into, I think... One outer reef day a long time ago. I think I was only like 21. This is bit back before we were having jet skis out for safety or inflatable vests mm-hmm. and any flotation. Just in literally in board shorts, just with my wow. one buddy, Dave Wassel. Probably the long board shorts too, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like I pick up the board that I was on now. I just saw it. I was like clearing out some bushes. And uh, it's insane that I was even trying to paddle in the big waves. And it's so narrow and thin. But uh, yeah, it was a it was a big day that got a lot bigger, and Wassel got a wave, an, an insane wave, and uh, broke his leash and had to swim in. And I was just out there by myself, and it got really, really big. And I was on that was one of the most like worried for my life days I've had. Wow. And it, it was basically the sun was going down, and it was I was barely making it over waves, like ten wave sets. 25 feet top to bottom spitting barrels and I'm like scratching over every That's wave the worst and I'm, I know I'm so tired. <laughs> yeah. I'm scratching so many times. I'm like, if I get caught by one of these, I'm going to straight up drown. Yeah. I got board shorts on my leash is going to break. I'm, and it's almost dark. Mm-hmm. So I actually caught a wave, which wasn't one of the biggest sets. It was like kind of a smaller to normal size set. Out of, out of survival. It's like, I have to catch a wave. It's the only way I'm getting in. I can't paddle in like into the impact zone. And the way to, that you get in from this outer reef, the the only like, <laughs> I don't know if you call it a channel, but you can't paddle wide and go in that way because mm-hmm. it's like four knots of current coming mm-hmm. in straight out to sea. So there's one way to get back in and that is to catch a wave or have a wave catch you. Dang. I decided to catch a wave. And uh, it was really big. Uh, I don't know. The size. I, I don't know. I give up on that stuff, yeah. man. It's I don't know, it's 50, 60 feet, something like mm-hmm. that on the face. Yeah. Um, after 20 feet, it's really hard to use the, yeah. the Hawaii scale. <laughs> like, is it, is it 30 feet now? <laughs> like, what is this? Is yeah. it 25? Is it 22? I don't yeah. even know. It's just big. It's just huge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dang, that's that's so wild. Yeah. Um, yeah, when 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 you uh, explain these stories, like, oh man, I just my heart just starts racing because like I it just makes me go back to when I like the times where I'm just like barely getting over a wave and you're, it's just like please don't go over the falls, please don't yeah. go over the falls, barely making it and it's like you're bailing halfway up yeah. and then having to fish your board back in. You're getting like your board's dragging mm-hmm. you because you had to swim through yeah, it, yeah. and it's like. It's like an ab workout. Yeah, yeah. It's like a CrossFit workout or something <laughs> like pulling the leash back to you after it's done pulling you and get on the board and then sprint and barely make it over to the next one. Do yeah. Repeat that like 10 times. Yeah. So so what do you do? So for example, that one time I was at Sunset, it was one of those, these, this rogue set came in. I was just paddling over, just made it over, just made it over. And then by the time I made it over the last one, I was so tired in this wave. I was like, oh, I'm not going to make it over this one. So that's when it just like, broke on top of me mm-hmm. i should have i think i should just ditch my board and try to swim under but i don't i don't remember what i did i don't really swim under i just kind of like i get off my board and just kind of stay vertical and just duck down hmm. well is that, i don't is like that swimming technique? into it because i feel like that's when I'm, my neck gets wrecked mm. it's like if i go down i'm not gonna you're not gonna make any headway yeah you're just expending energy um my goal typically unless i'm backed up against a, a cliff or something um 
I I I want to be high in the water column so the wave is more likely to keep me high in the water column and it's more likely to push me further in and away from the impact zone. Mm -hmm. So okay. I like to be basically on the surface, get underwater enough and just kind of make sure my neck doesn't get rattled and oh, okay, I'm gonna try that. go with it. So you kind of just ditch your board and kind of just like, like pencil or like kind of, yeah. yeah. Huh, interesting. Sometimes I'll do that. Sometimes I'll head a little bit into mm -hmm. it, but, um, yeah, it's gonna do what it wants with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> me, like, there's only so much we can control. Yeah. There's been times where it's like really big, and then it's just, I'm just like, okay, I'm over. So I try to catch a whitewash in. Mm -hmm. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Yeah. That's a. I mean, you're you're trying to. I always think of it as like I'm. You're, you're trying to cheat and budget and do every little thing to conserve as much energy. So when you find situations where you're able to use the energy around you to get to where you want to go, always use it. Mm. So if your your goal is to get out of that impact zone and away from the most powerful parts of the waves, that means you got to go in. And if a wave can take me in, I'm happy with it. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So this next question comes from lovevj.v. This person wants to know, I don't really understand this question, but <laughs> <laughs> how good was it to live in Hawaii? I think um, maybe how good is, is it, it to live in Hawaii? I love it, man. I love this place with all my heart for <laughs> sure. Um, it's special. It's it's different than any. I've been all around the world, and I love a lot of places, or I like a lot of places around the world, I should say. But Hawaii is different. It's it's special. It really is. Um, you know, from like a, a point of geography to the people to the history culture. Um. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm an island guy. That's the way it is. Mm -hmm. I I like it. Yeah. What's your favorite thing about Hawaii besides the surf? Um, the sense of community. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that uh, that's really special here, especially compared to like the rest of the United States, which is in disarray. But you have pockets of it. You know, you have like rural places. I I go up to places like Montana and stuff like that, or and and find these awesome pockets mm -hmm. and strangely i feel i feel like the south is almost more like hawaii than anywhere else in the continental south. u.s so like where like specifically like just the general south of like mississippi alabama new orleans, new orleans that kind of stuff i think it's because they're like in the south there's still there's st still a large amount of population that are like getting food from the land mm. so they have like a different kind of relationship with mm. it you yeah. know they're more active in their environment they're more a part of it and it's you know small town kind of things and i mean yeah we're hunting boas they're hunting gators yeah what? <laughs> they're hunting boars they got lifted trucks it's <laughs> it's true, it's yeah. funny like they, they're it's almost the same <laughs> yeah but uh but that not the same <laughs> same same but different yeah <laughs> okay Joe Willems Z, Joe Willems. Some people got some so such hard Instagram <laughs> handles sometimes. I'm just glad you're, <laughs> yeah. you're reading them, and not me. Uh, uh, this person wants to know how did you meet the goat Kimmy Warner? Um, I met Kimmy through um, just mutual dive buddies. Uh, gosh, I don't even remember how. I think I think the first time we all hung out um was uh me and my wife we weren't married then and and kimmy and and justin her now husband uh and up at their house in pupakea and we we were working on like a video piece or something and she oh yeah she was working on a video piece for something um so i was like yeah yeah i'll come and do it and we hung out for a bit i think we ended up one thing led to another and it's like 1 a.m. and we ate a bunch of mushrooms and we all <laughs> all had a good fry together and we've been like family ever since. Wow. It's because of the mushrooms. The mushrooms fried <laughs> together. <laughs> That's yeah. so funny. It's like, okay, this is, we'll all get along here. That's awesome. Yeah, Kimmy's so awesome. Justin's awesome. She, she officiated your wedding, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah she awesome. married us. 
That's and I officiated hers. Oh, no and Justin's, Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. She got I, me back. <laughs> I'm an officiant too, so I just officiated my um, my friend's wedding. It's so easy. Anybody can do it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's a little scary. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. I, I just, get those emails every now and then. I'm like, <laughs> I'm a reverend. Yeah, yeah. I need to put that in my Instagram title or something. <laughs> I should have put that in your your introduction. <laughs> yeah, Reverend yeah. <laughs> Mark Ely. Just it, that would be a fun little thing, like a competition between a friend to like stack as many like meaningless titles as you could <laughs> and see how who has the most. Who has the most? Yeah. Make a business card at the end of the year, so you guys has, has the most that you can just get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna think about that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, bring that up to my friends in Hilo. Yeah. See what they think. <laughs> Esquire, yeah, <laughs> Reverend Esquire. Well, I definitely would put fantasy football player, professional fantasy football. Oh, nice. Yeah. Even though, I don't, how would you even say your fantasy in really small font? <laughs> no, no, people. big, big. <laughs> I want the whole world to know. <laughs> There's nothing more real than fantasy football. That's what I say. <laughs> okay, so uh, this next question comes from the same person. Uh, they they want to know what is it like to live in Hawaii as a non-native. Um, well, I mean, define non-native. <laughs> Born here, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not like Kanaka. I'm not yeah, like I think Hawaiian. That's what they mean. I'm white boy, obviously. Um, but I mean, it's home. It's all I know. Mm-hmm. But it's weird to have a place that's home and it's all you know. It's like literally where you came into this conscious life, and and still like you're kind of on the outside sometimes yeah. too. Um. But that's just the nature of it. Mm-hmm. That's the way it goes. I'm not going to complain about that. But, I mean, it's funny because, you know, we judge people off the color of their skin. Uh, but there's a lot of local people, Hawaiian people, that are Hawaiian, that don't act Hawaiian. And there's a lot of people on the opposite end that don't look Hawaiian, but are way more local and yeah. act Hawaiian. Than the, the best is growing up yeah. and it's like, my Filipino friends calling me a Holly. I'm like, bro, <laughs> you don't got an ounce of Hawaiian blood in you. <laughs> I don't either. Don't you dare do this to me right now. <laughs> but, you know, just as joking. That's that's a good thing about Hawaii, too. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things I like is you can make racial jokes, mm-hmm. and it's still funny. People, like, we can never lose that. Like, yes. people don't take themselves as seriously here, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, I've, I've had conversations like that Um with other people about how things have changed, you know, the whole PC culture, mm-hmm. everybody's sensitive. I do believe, you know, I try to be respectful to it. Yes, everyone, yes, obviously. But I do believe everyone is so sensitive these days. Yeah. Um, it's like, I mean, obviously that... See, oh. even this printer is sensitive. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, what you said? <laughs> racist, racist, yeah. racist. <laughs> Sexist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... uh. Yeah, obviously there's a spectrum of yeah. jokes, but it's just like, yeah, some of my some of my really close Hawaiian friends will be like, "Hey, fuck it, Ollie," <laughs> you know, across because they know that'll just get me like, yeah. oh, you, you son of a bitch, I what's up, you dumb moke?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's but that's our banter back and forth, mm-hmm. you yes. know. And you do it with people you're comfortable with you know if you're yes if I'm saying exactly like somebody oh you dumb holly to somebody i don't know then that's a little bit more offensive <laughs> totally. right? totally yeah but, but we, I'm, I'm glad generally <laughs> like with people you're comfortable with it's yeah. not like a big deal <laughs> yeah yes i i totally agree i think especially growing up where a lot of things were more weren't so off limits you know yeah um and our culture like we were Look at all the comedians back then. It was all cultural, ra- Filipino, all Portuguese, Japanese, yeah. Haole, Hawaiian. Franklin, Lima, Rap, like, Replinger. Exactly. We can say, you know. I can tell you all the stereotypes we have. You know, Portuguese are dumb. They talk too much. You know, like. But it, it, everybody can laugh at it because it's like, yeah. yeah, you're not taking it seriously. It's just like kind of like a, a little pivot point to have an excuse to make up funny stuff. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and there there is some truth to a lot like a lot of um, stereotypes. You know? Yes, there, stereotypes are yeah. s- stereotypes for a reason. <laughs> yeah, like believe me, I know. Like <laughs> my wife will laugh. I'm like, fucking hell, he's got <laughs> like, just like losing it in traffic because it's it's for a reason. And when I see that, and I see people acting like that, that look like me, I'm like, you son of a bitch. You made my life hard. People like you is why I had to deal with so much. Yeah. 
that's kind of what what it is. It's just one person ruins it for everybody else. Yeah, right? but but at the end of the day, we're all human beings, and there's you know you get a batch of human beings together, no matter what color they are, where they're from. There's people that are gonna be awesome, people that are gonna be kind of yeah. shitty and rude or disrespectful or yeah, it's people, the way it is. It's a human can, nature. Yeah, yes, exactly. And and being judgmental is part of being human. Like we're all mm-hmm. judgmental, you know as humans but it's just we don't not everybody has like speaks their mind i think that's the totally and <laughs> you know i mean this is the whole thing about like the like anti-racism thing it's like well define it. it's kind of like how i was saying like there's different gradients of fear mm-hmm. you know like his, or english language is very inadequate in a lot of these things and they're like you know what if there's a hawaiian guy who doesn't have any holly friends whose family's land was taken by some like Holly banker. And then they just deal with rude tourists all day long. I don't blame him for being racist against Mm -hmm. Holly's like that's, that's why humans are effective is because we recognize patterns. Mm. And if that's the only pattern that you've been given, you'd be a fool not to make that assumption going forward, or at least like have that in the back of your head when you're dealing with people, because you got to protect yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's common sense. It's mm-hmm. like to deny that, you know, like, that's why I, you know, I don't get offended about that kind of stuff. I'm like, I don't know this person's life experience. They probably, mm-hmm. they could have ran into a bunch of people that looked just like me that were just, and had bad experiences across the board. Mm. Yeah. I think it's a lot of times it's not personal. We just take it personally. Yeah. Uh, and it's more about that person. You don't know what trauma they've been to. You don't know what, what affects them, what triggers them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. Uh, People are sensitive sometimes, but once in a while, it's for a good reason. Yeah. Um, Usually it's, oh God, what is that that term? Um, I think it was a Mark Twain one. It's about, essentially it's about like how ridiculous the mental anguish we put ourselves through. Like mm. we're, it's, <laughs> it's like we've been through so many bad things and sometimes they actually happen. Kind of <laughs> something along those lines. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. we kind of, the human brain's a crazy thing. Yes, definitely. We can whip ourselves into a frenzy real quick. Yeah. Well, um, I want to talk more about the human brain and some stuff. But I uh, just want to say mahalo to everybody for leaving the Instagram questions. Make sure you leave some for our next guest, and maybe your question will make it on the podcast. Um, speaking about the, the human brain, um, and you mentioned that uh, you when you met Kimmy, you guys did a little bit of shrooms. Um, our sponsor for this episode is actually Silly.com, um, and they're this new uh, company based out of Maui. Uh, they haven't gone public yet, I think, mm-hmm. um, but they're about to. And their therapeutic plant medicine, plant-based therapeutic medicine to help with mental health, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, and it was, it was really interesting when I first, first met the guy, David. I think I'll have him on the podcast at some point. And um, there's a bunch of documentaries on um, mushrooms and like the effects of it on... Uh, the human brain help, helps people with PTSD, um, schizophrenia, and all these things. And there's also just like the stories where, you know, your friend told you that one time they shroomed, they went to Burning Man, whatever. Yeah. They just went, went to a waterfall, did some hikes. I and mean, I've had friends that tell me their stories. I've never tried it myself, but um, it's interesting. It's like something that uh, I'm more open to than, you know, it's organic, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's natural. Um, other than, you know, I'm not going to try crystal meth or crystal <laughs> cocaine, something like Please that. Please don't. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I trip out on is people are like looking around. They're like, seems to be going really good for everyone else <laughs> smoking batu. I think I'm going to pick it up. Like, how do you, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point. I never thought of it like that. Like, why would somebody start? But I guess maybe generational thing. Yeah. Habits. Yeah. The, the, like you said, the people you surround yourself with, you know, that's seems like that's what everybody does you know mm-hmm. if you're you come from a family of alcoholics most likely you're gonna drink right totally yeah or you need escape yeah exactly yeah that's an interesting thing that's different you know about about uh, like uh, psychoactives or like mm-hmm. like mushrooms mm-hmm. like it's not it's a it's a totally different change of of perspective but it's not really an escape I think that's probably one of the reasons why people, it's not very addictive. Mm -hmm. It's actually like anti-addictive, it seems like, um, in that 
you're gonna you're gonna face whatever mood or whatever thoughts most likely that you have coming into it mm -hmm. um so it's interesting it's it's kind of the opposite of like a hard uh mm -hmm. hard drug yeah i i mean i hear people about you know going on this journey you know to find themselves you know and they, there's also like uh i guess more powerful things like ayahuasca and you know mm -hmm. peyote and all that stuff but like microdosing um it's like that's that's the stuff where you can do just like you take and you can just go on your your regular day and just like I hear it's like everything becomes more vivid or you know it's just you, you maybe you learn something or you just you have more appreciation on life and stuff like that. What was your like experience? It's uh I haven't done a lot of micro dosing. It's been more macro dosing to be honest. What's the difference in micro and macro? Just a lot. Oh <laughs> <laughs> no, but I I've taken. Uh, yeah, light doses, and mm -hmm. um, I mean, some of the funnest surfs I've ever had in my life have been doing that. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> it's very set and setting. I think uh, it's been super beneficial the times that I've done it. In that, um, the the common theme is ego death. Like mm -hmm. your ego just gets it's like not there anymore. So you can view the world, <clears throat> relationships, things like that, without your ego. And then you realize how much of a big player your ego is in every single thing that you do all the time. And you're like, God, why am I carrying this thing around? It doesn't make sense. I'm so much happier without it. Mm -hmm. So at least you, you know, whether that sticks or not, at least you got to feel what that's like and have a reference point. Um, and uh, yeah, and you just, you look at different things like that were right in front of your nose, like, like kind of ingrained ways of thinking and thought patterns that you have and you're like it makes so much sense it's right here why why do i think of it that way like yeah. you just you're like got a someone else's brain put it in your head mm -hmm. like, and you can retain that later yeah do you think you can get to that point without taking the mushrooms um like what, through meditation like, yoga, probably or? probably mm -hmm. um yeah I, I i would imagine so Mm -hmm. I mean, the, it's just triggering, the mushrooms are just triggering something that's already in your head. Yeah. Like that's, that's an interesting thing when, mm -hmm. if you are on mushrooms and you're like, when you remind yourself like, this is all in my head. That was mm -hmm. just like something that triggered something that was already mm -hmm. there. Like, wow. I had no idea that this was in there. Yeah. I can, yeah. And I can see how that's beneficial. Like there's a lot of health benefits to that, especially people who are struggling with, mm -hmm. with, you know, mental disorders. Um, or, but people can also have shockers. I've seen people like, like bad trigger, trips. well, trigger, like they're probably heading in the direction of, you know, sch schizophrenia and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, that usually happens towards your late twenties. I and, think 26. I think that's, that's what I That's heard. typical. Yeah. But you should check before using any of those psychedelics, you should check your family history of mental, yeah. mental health. Or mental Cause I, I, I know mm -hmm. probably three people mm -hmm. who've that that kicked them in that direction. Yeah, I know. Or it I know seemed to be. Yeah. Or, or like two that I've heard of. So it's not, I mean, it's just like anything else in life. It's like, there's no, fr there's really no free rides in life. Mm -hmm. Like everybody wants an easy button, but you have to use your brain. You have to think like, what's the cost benefit on this thing? Yeah, yeah. And how do you, I use it? What's best for me? What's yeah. best for me might not be the best for everyone else. Like use your noggin. Oh, it sounds like something else. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we're past that. We're past that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, I I want to know. So, growing growing up on the North Shore and that you know surf culture, there's a lot of tourists coming in and out. There's also a big local culture over there. Mm -hmm. you, you said you you stuck out like a sore thumb. Um, did you ever feel like you had to like prove yourself to fit in with everybody? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess anybody listening to this, mm -hmm. compared to like you know, some suburb in, in like Orange County or something like I, Hawaii is, that's the culture. It's like, it's a, this is a warring culture. Mm -hmm. Not that long ago. Like there, there definitely is like a rite of passage kind of expectation for young men. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, like you have to prove yourself. Yoda, have a gold <laughs> chain, stun a shades for a century. <laughs> well, and you, you got it. You're so, I mean, if, if, if you're not doing something courageous or proving yourself or this, that, or the other, 
you're acting like you did. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> exactly. no, yeah, there's yeah. not a lot. Like, I would say by in large, that's an expectation of a young male. So yeah, I was like, oh, hell yeah, I want to prove myself. I'm down for this game. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, it's uh, to me what it really drew me to big waves more so than that is that it's just an even playing field. Mm. It's like I'm so used to being the smallest guy, being broke, you know, not having the cool toys or bikes or whatever, you know. Um, but when you get out in the ocean, big surf, playing field is absolutely level. So you get to see people's true colors. You get mm-hmm. to see the real them come out. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, okay, you're a pussy. <laughs> I see it now. <laughs> or you're like, damn, you're a freaking lion inside, mm-hmm. man. This little quiet dude is just a hammer. You're like, yeah. I want you on my team. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's be friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is so true. I, I think I think it it goes both ways too, where either like you're trying to be somebody like in the water because you're not somebody out of the water mm-hmm. or you're not somebody out of the water. So you're trying to be somebody in the water like, oh, I'm such a good surfer and like. And that, and that is like a totally a dynamic that happens in surfing. I know that. But that's the that's a magic of when it gets mm-hmm. a certain size to where it's like, yeah, <laughs> I think I that's that's like second and third in line in my thought process right mm-hmm. now. Number one is just staying alive. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's not about being cool. Who yeah. gets the most curls? It's who's gonna survive this? <laughs> this that, big, and that's what I love and the there. bonds that you make through yeah. that, you know, and. Um, it's really hard to see people's true colors. You know, obviously, just because you you charge at big wave surfing doesn't mean you're not going to, like, burn somebody in a business deal as soon as it starts going sideways. Mm-hmm. But um, but it is good to, to at least have one vector where you're like, I see how that human is. Mm-hmm. At least that aspect of them. Yeah. Be- oh. Because it's so hard. How many people that, that you'll know your whole life, but you've never seen them under true stress? Mm-hmm. You've never seen them, how they act when pressure is applied yeah so you don't really know them yeah, yeah i don't that, think you know anybody until pressure is applied. exactly yeah that's what i've always thought in relationships mm-hmm. it's like one of the most important things before i you know decide if i want to be with somebody like long term it's like how are they under stress how do they treat others under stress yes that was yeah. my dad's line he always told me it's like <laughs> whenever you're dating a girl you pay attention to how she treats waiters mm-hmm. how she how she speaks if she's had she's talking about a friend she had a falling out with or whatever. He's like, that will be pointed in your direction one day if you stay long enough. Yeah, That's just the nature of relationships. So if you can live with that, just make that decision, make that call. That that's how I knew I was into my my girlfriend because when I was at Sunset that one time, I broke the board. It was her board, her brand (laughs) new board. This is the first, like the first time we surfed North Shore together. It's oh like, my like, god! A week into dating, ultimate two, dumbass. Two, huh? two weeks into dating, she <laughs> told me she's like, "It's not that bad." Like I took her single fin log out, and uh, it ended up being bigger than we thought. It was uh-huh. just a random, random swell that came in. Uh, so I, I was like, I was at a disadvantage, but I caught all the way, so I'm a little proud of that. Um, but when I when that happened, I was like, "Oh, she's gonna be like so pissed." It's her brand new board. I felt so bad, but like. She didn't even, the one thing, when that all happened, she was just, like, helping me paddle in. She grabbed the other board, like, checking if I was okay. I was like, <gasps> like, I was like, I, was like, I swallowed so much water. I just was, like, sitting there. She's, like, rubbing my back. Oh, jeez, uh, what and, a keeper. And and then she didn't even get mad. I was like, okay, you got you're like, you got to be a little bit mad, right? I just broke your board. I bought her a new board. But, um, yeah, she was, like, so calm under pressure. Like, moments like that. Yeah. Where it's just like you see somebody's true true colors. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So it's it's really really important to see that type of stress. Okay. So um, that uh, going back to um, you you trying to like um, prove yourself. Did did you feel like doing these things like surfing, maybe getting into um, like spear fishing, all of that helped you like improve your like local social status? I think it was, uh, I'm lucky in, the, in that they're a, a win on both ends, I guess. Yeah. Um, I just like escaping. Mm-hmm. I like raw nature. It's You get to go do your thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know you know what you're going to get. It's pretty, well, it's, it's surprising, but the, in the way that nature deals with you, it's pretty straightforward. 
It's not, there's not a bunch of sprinkles on top of it. It's not nature isn't s- passive silver tongue devil <laughs> stuff. Like, <laughs> you know, I, and I like that simplicity of it, mm-hmm. but I guess because those are two things that are kind of part of Hawaii culture that they helped on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. That is, it, it is a, like such a struggle for, especially males here mm-hmm. is like trying to fit in. Like, Oh, do you, you have to surf, you have to spear fish, you got, you got to fish, you know, to be viewed as local or, you know, be like a local boy. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, do what, whatever you're into. I just feel like you just get really bored and stir crazy if you didn't do those <laughs> yeah, things yeah. living on an island to yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. But, but that's just my perspective. Yeah. I mean, we have all these amazing things that we can do. I mean, I never grew up in the water. I played land sports all my life. Mm-hmm. So I'm only getting into the water in my adulthood. Oh, God. So it's like wide open. You, yeah, there's so, so much so I many things do. to do. Yeah. <laughs> like, I haven't gotten into diving yet. Uh-huh. Uh, or like, I mean, Micah and Leia, you know, they're, they yep. love diving. But he would always tell me like go sir like let's go sandy let's go dive and i never would do it because i just i just want to play basketball i just want to do this you know but now it's just like with surfing i just i got that bug right yeah so now it's like it's exciting because i can see all these things that i want to do in my adulthood like getting into diving spear fishing fishing um maybe even hunting you know I like mm-hmm. weapons, so, you know, I have nunchucks. I, I know yeah. how to use nunchucks. You go so nunchucks like, on board and yeah. that. <laughs> Nobody ever nunchuck hunts, right? Just put some blades at the end. <laughs> please, please do it. Part, part of my, uh, one of the episodes in Master, uh, Jack of all trades, Master of None with Kamaka Diaz. <laughs> nunchucks, <laughs> nunchucks, sorry. Messing Pat up my pending. own TV show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so what what motivates you to, to do all these things that you do? Um... I just, I like learning. Mm -hmm. I like learning about um, the environment around me and myself. I like uh, learning in that you can appreciate things more when you know more about them. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, if I can, if you can think of like, we'll use UFC as an example again. I know it's come up a bunch of times, (laughs) but once, you know, somebody, if they know nothing about fighting and they go to like do a week of jujitsu, all of a sudden they're like, Oh my God, I know what a rear naked choke is. You know, I know what full mount is. I know what passing guard is and all that stuff. It becomes so much interest, more interesting. And that opens like so many different avenues off of all those concepts. Mm -hmm. So you're more engaged. You're more appreciative. Um, The more things in life that I can do that with, the better. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point you can appreciate just sitting in your yard, I guess, (laughs) you know, like, wow, this is. Oh, the bees are back. And <laughs> yeah, or just seeing the plants that ha- yeah. have grown. You did that. You know how long it takes to do that, how much attention you have to give to these things so they can grow mm-hmm. prosperously. I guess it's so. just being like an active player in life mm-hmm. and not just being like, oh, one day I'll be happy. <laughs> you know, one day it's everybody else's <laughs> fault. It's not mine, you know. It's, you yeah, know. that is true. I, it is... It is a pet peeve of mine when people are hard on people, like, especially like just watching something on TV or seeing something on social media. Mm-hmm. Like say people are watching a football game, somebody misses a pass or doesn't tackle somebody. They're like, oh, that guy sucks. Oh, God. It's well, so funny. The whole armchair quarterback thing. Yeah. And you know who's not armchair quarterbacks? People who have tried hard stuff a lot, mm-hmm. usually, because yeah. they're like, hey, that that's probably more difficult, and I can't even understand what level things are working at there. I appreciate watching it. I might not like the team. I might not like the player, but you know, it's it's like watching fights. I'm like, I don't see a guy get knocked out. I'm like, you saw yeah. a clown. I'm like, God, man, that was brave getting in there. It took yeah. a lot of work, and yeah. you know, I would have gotten knocked out in the first five <laughs> seconds. So. Yeah, I can't say a thing. Very true, and it, with, with surfing especially, and like I've always had a respect I, for athletes, and especially surfing. I just never did it in my life, but oh my god, that all the things you you learn real quick that how hard surfing is. It's crazy because like you don't think okay, it's not just catching a wave; it's paddling. The endurance of paddling is so tiring, mm-hmm. especially because. Nobody, if you, it's you weird don't muscles. in the water, yeah, you yeah. don't like do this a lot. So you get so tired and then, you know, you have to deal with the crowd and then waves and understanding the wave. There's so much you have to, to learn just to be able to catch that wave. So yeah. I have so much respect for like 
the people that like you that do it at the highest level crazy well thanks um but yeah there's no easy button that's an interesting thing because i've i've helped teach a, a lot of people how to surf and stuff and uh i've because i've you know been in this i quote action sports world for a long time i've been lucky enough to get to know people from like you know professional snowboarders skaters you know all different kinds of pursuits and take them surfing and they're like obviously like way outperforming as far as their technical ability when they're up on a wave but as far as like navigating a lineup you know knowing the timing where to sit how to catch the wave when to turn around start paddling there's no easy button for that mm -hmm. it just takes time mm -hmm. and that's one of the cool things about surfing like it just takes time for certain parts of it mm -hmm. you just you just gotta keep doing like you said in the beginning is um you just gotta i don't know the exact word you said but you just gotta get accustomed to it or just get that yeah. experience yeah yeah that that's what i learned too because I, I i would surf just sporadically uh, and i could never get good <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then it was into this year where I would go a couple times a week, and I was like, "Oh, I'm actually getting better." Wow, what a yeah. light bulb moment, right? Because <laughs> you have to do it consistently <laughs> enough to. There's so many actions throughout the the act of surfing that are that have to be automatic things, like almost subconscious. To, it just happens. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have to really think about getting up to my feet. Like I, it just happens now. So you're just stacking as many skills within that sport. To just happen naturally so you can focus on the next steps and just be focused on that so yeah it's the hardest time obviously is when you have to actively think about doing every little aspect of it and you gotta mm -hmm. think and send that message to the muscles <laughs> and like oh that didn't work out so well adjust yeah it's a it's a multitasking issue i feel like mm -hmm. well i mean you're a very disciplined person and you you have these traits from these other things that you've done and it, I feel like it easily translates into other things like for bull hunting when you started learning bull, bull hunting. I, I'm sure you still, you know, you weren't the best when you did it, but no. you, you had like all these <laughs> skills already, you know, you were disciplined, you know, you had to put in the hours. You, you, if you mm -hmm. missed a shot, you know, you, you, kn you knew how to make the adjustment or you, you knew who to ask for advice. Yeah, I think that's the um, the the best thing, especially like thinking about my daughter and what I'm going to try to instill in her. It's UFC like, fighter, easy. Yeah. Hammer. First, first female NFL player. Just, <laughs> just multiple concussions by 12. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's learning how to learn. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just like, if you've learned something and gotten pretty good at it and spent time at it, you have the framework of how to learn and you just plug in other new things to that. Mm -hmm. that that was one of the cool things about i took uh jimmy chin the climber and filmmaker a buddy of mine and we did a, a trip with yeti and he just wanted to get his first barrel surfing and so we were just like helping him and building him up and teaching him what he's got to do and you can see why he's so good at all the things that he does is because he's the best learner i've ever worked with with uh surfing like he's like okay this is my skill. I'm going to try this, whether it's the right wave for it or not, on every single wave. I'm going to, like, try this grab rail. Just learn how to drop in and grab rail. Just hammer that one skill for one day, and then all of a sudden, he's got it. He's on to the next one. Boom, 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 boom. Like, he's so disciplined, and he knows the framework of learning. That's, that's a really good point. I think we focus so much on being good at something, specifically, instead of just being a good learner. Mm -hmm. being a good listener and i feel like that can translate to a lot of aspects in our life women are typically way better learners <laughs> than men because they have less ego about it yeah and be probably better attention spans yes <laughs> yeah be, be a good learner in life i i know that like i'm not just tr trying to throw <laughs> the ladies a bone on this one i know from teaching men and women things in the water <laughs> like oh my gosh they're That's so funny. much easier <laughs> yeah the ego that's that's a bad thing okay um so what's in what's in ideal day for you? Like, because you're also a businessman, you have a bunch of companies. You have yeah. like Healy, Water Ops. Yeah, Protect. I'm a co-founder of Protect, um, which we do supplements um, and sunscreens, which is going good. And we're on year three, and that's that's blown up. We just got um, highlighted our rest product. We got a great sleep product as well. Um, just got hi highlighted on Tim Ferriss's Five Bullet oh, Fridays. Yeah. So nice. Um, 
you know, it's a good stamp of legitimacy. We worked hard at it. And then um, I'm a co-founder of a subscription beach lifestyle box called Beachly. Mm. So we've had that. We're at about 28,000 uh, quarterly subscribers. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So um, what is that? You, you just send, uh, it's like one of those just random boxes that people get with a bunch yeah, of things so that they like. We, they get to punch in their style preferences. Um, we got a really good formula that works for that. Um, and it's a curated box. Um, it's with surprise products, but we also have like an online store and like discounts that are only available to members mm. and like the value that people get, honestly, I'm not just being a used car salesman here, but <laughs> the value is in pretty incredible what people mm. get in for what they pay for these boxes. And, and what, what kind of things are inside? Yeah. So it's, what's happened is first we started with men's, we still have the men's side of thing. And then we did the women's and the women's just like grew so much faster. Hmm. Um, it definitely hit a chord in the women's market. Um, so yeah, at, at first it's, it was like very like technical, harder goods. It was like maybe a board short, uh, a, a really good like dive mask and a towel hmm. or something like that. And now it's the women's side. You have a lot of different things. It could be, you know, bathing suit, you know, depending on season or like if it's coming in fall, it might be like a cute sweater, beanie, mm -hmm. uh, fragrance, um, skin product, mm -hmm. things like that. It changes every quarter. That's, that's cool. It's a cool idea. I know uh, my brother, ha my little brother, he has a subscription to some something he likes, some like video game or I don't know, something mm -hmm. similar to that, which like a surprise box. And it's really popular. Yeah, I I like surprises. Yeah, <laughs> <Who does laughs> I like it? that. I would... <laughs> It's funny too because um, I I don't have uh, an apparel contract. I was I was pretty much have been having to wear only certain kinds of clothes mm -hmm. for my whole life because that's one of the main contracts you get in mm -hmm. surfing. And I'm like fully wearing the stuff I get from my boxes, the beach leaf boxes. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> like Wait, hey, so this is handy. Like yeah, I'm back in this mode it's again. Different I like it. brands you you get yep. it from the different places. Oh, yep. okay, I see. Yeah, it's all different brands. We make some stuff on our own. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, yeah, reaching out to different brands and um, and being like, hey, this would resonate with our audience. Mm -hmm. Or we're at the size now to where, like, this would resonate with our audience. Can you make it? Mm. So that was a very nice dynamic shift from, like, asking favors and having people do favors for me to go out their way to have, like, a premium surf brand slice off you know 200 items for it yeah it's like it's not worth their trouble mm -hmm. you know now they come to us which is great that's cool yeah I, it's cool when that like you said the dynamic shift yeah uh, that like for me the podcast in, in the beginning i was just like asking just sending dms hey can you come on the podcast you know, going through people with connections and now it's like so many messages and, and it's like but cool. now like, but now you're back to this theme that we hit on a lot a lot now you know that that dynam dynamic shift happens. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to quit when you know you haven't hit the shift point at, mm -hmm. at least yet in like a new business venture mm -hmm. or something like that. You have that hope. It's that, that there's that um, mouse experiment um, where they, they timed how long it take, takes mice to drown. Mm. They put them, you ever hear that? No, no. They put them in a tube of water that's just big enough for them to be in it and they have to go and just struggle until they drown. So, and they time it and they did this to a ton of different mice. And then the other group, they let them go to within like a minute of the usual time. Then they pull them out and they do it again the next day. And they go like 20 times longer hmm. because they have the hope. They think they're going to get pulled out again. They can oh. survive longer struggling because of that. And oh. I think that's learning process that's business that's all these things say, yeah, just and so like, many people never get they just they only do that struggle initial part and they're like oh it's never gonna happen i'm giving up so they never know of that hope that, that's on the other side of things mm -hmm. so it is like a, a, a self-fulfilling cycle it feeds on itself and the more times you do it and pull it off you're like okay i can go longer i can go harder i can put up with more mm -hmm. yeah that that's why it's so important to never give up and keep pushing your limits Mm -hmm. Keep keep getting through that uncomfortableness and just you know eventually you get out get get out to the other side. Yeah, and it, you know, like in my tone, sometimes people 
my my message request inbox is like Afghanistan in there. It's like crazy people write me a lot. Um, but people think I'm like coming off as like an asshole sometimes when I'm like saying like, no, like don't make excuses and stuff. I'm not trying to be a dick. Mm -hmm. It's because I care about people. Like I, I want people to be able to experience their full potential. Like mm -hmm. excuses just don't get you there. Yeah. And I'm wanting handouts and, you know, blaming people your problems on other people. Mm, so socialism. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't work. Uh, that's so, so what's a like morning to night? What, what's an average day for you? Surf, work, hang out with your family? I totally avoided that question. Originally. No, <laughs> I just totally went off the rails. No, Sorry. But I, um, I, I love that answer that you gave. Um, yeah. So I'm going to get up. I'm going to make coffee, take my supplements, uh, Go feed the chickens and goats. Uh, probably start calls and emails um, because being in Hawaii, the time difference, you have to start early, unfortunately. So it kind of steals a lot of mornings unless there's something special happening in nature. Um, uh, see my daughter when she wakes up and then uh, spend, a, spend some time with her and then hit the road, get outside, get after whatever task or thing I'm doing um yeah come back have dinner with the family pass out <laughs> actually cool. not pass out stay up for like four hours on YouTube like <laughs> looking up weird things like how to like weld with old car batteries and stuff. <laughs> are you pretty handy I'm not that handy oh okay that's why I'm learning. probably handier than mo like we have a fairly low bar for handiness mm -hmm. with adult males these days so <laughs> maybe I'm like <laughs> slightly handier than the average guy but not like our parents' generation. Handy. Yes, yes. There, there's a lot of things that we can buy that we the setup is easier. It's 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 not as like you don't have to do everything yourself. Maybe you just have like two things that you gotta like nail in, but mm -hmm. it makes us look really good. Yeah, yeah. So I was putting up a chicken coop the other day, and I was just like, of course, it's this like from China Amazon one, and it's um, like steel pipe, and uh, they didn't have some of the holes bored. I was just like. God, I'm gonna have to do something. My own drilled holes. I was just throwing a little hissy fit about it. I was like, "Got it. All it is is three, three holes. <laughs> Don't take yourself so seriously." <laughs> but after my dad builds houses. <laughs> but after you did it, you're like, "Yeah, I'm a man." Yeah, guys. <laughs> hey, hon, check this out. <laughs> Look at me. God, did you score? <laughs> That's so funny. There is that like side of the the male bravado where it's like everything we do we want somebody to like to look at us like all the things we we did like the cool things like hey look what i built or like, oh yeah look at this cool move i did it's did like see me on the last way boy scout badges dude <laughs> yeah. i'm i'm like that like i i suffer my girlfriend and like every time i catch a wave I, I paddle back out to her i'm like did you see that like so i did this and i like i walked to the nose a little bit but i, I couldn't get all the way to the top so i was like kind of just staying there and then i like did put one foot in front kind of like a kook but then i got out and she's like She's like, you're the only person I know that explains every single way to me. <laughs> I just think of like, I, you're probably too young, but do you remember the, the movie Airplane? No. There's a comedy. Anyways, there's a scene in it <laughs> where the lady's like talking every guy's ear off. Like, blah, 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 blah. that's on the plane. And they're all like killing themselves in different ways. Turn, turn around, the guy's like pouring gasoline on himself. The other guy hangs himself. It's just nobody can survive it. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny happens yeah <laughs> okay um all right so we're, we're coming to the end of the podcast i, I got a couple more questions i want to ask you um what is your biggest accomplishment my biggest accomplishment is becoming a father mm. awesome for sure why was that so important to you well i stayed alive long enough to do it <laughs> which was pretty sweet um, I mean, yeah, if go, go to YouTube and just see what he does. And then you, I didn't, you I honestly didn't think I was going to live till 30. Like for real, I wasn't planning past 30. I was like, eh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to croak, but like, yeah, it's really hard to get struck by lightning. Very few people do. But if you regular, regularly run around with a 20 foot metal rod in your hands in Florida, you're probably going to get struck by lightning. Did you get eventually. struck by lightning? No, but I'm okay. just saying, like, I'm buying a lot of lottery tickets here. I'm exposing myself a lot. Yeah. Um, 
so uh yeah just getting to this point in life and um yeah being a dad's like number one mm -hmm. by far best thing ever that's awesome i'm happy to hear that um uh, okay so what is something you wish people knew about you that they don't um hmm wonder what i think what i w i think i wish my intentions were more clear mm -hmm. in the things that i say and do and maybe that's probably bad on me for not explaining it as much i'm very i can be very direct mm -hmm. you know but my intentions are almost always because i want the best for other people mm -hmm. and um you know i do a lot of for some reason it's like it's a lot of polarizing stuff when you're in the social media world and you have 225,000 followers. Like, you're killing animals! <laughs> I'm like, you are too with your credit card, but you don't think about it, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever it is. It's like, yeah, I want healthy food. I want to be accountable for what I do. Um, yeah, but it's, it, it's hard to el enunciate or elicit, like, what your true intentions behind your actions are sometimes, especially to a diverse group of people with a diverse range of how much fucks they give mm -hmm. to actually put any real thought into something. Yeah, if you had to respond to every single person that doesn't like what you do, it's, you'd be oh there my forever. God. You want to yeah. see how many thousands of <laughs> <laughs> messages I, I have I in there? I, just, I, I don't even look at them. <laughs> like, yeah. God, I feel yeah. bad for all the people who actually like reach out for something important or nice because I'm like, I can't, I'm not even going through these messages. Yeah, exactly. And that's an example of one person ruining it for everybody else. Yeah. yeah. So somebody shat in the bowl of punch and yeah. now <laughs> nobody can have punch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh man, that, that's so funny. It, it, do you like it? Like the, the social media, like having all the followers? It's, it's a tool and it's, it has really cool benefits to it i get i get to learn stuff mm -hmm. i may get to make connections with people in other places in the world that are like mm -hmm. um and i get to stay in touch with friends mm -hmm. you know i'm not i used to i've been on the road for six months a year probably from 18 years old to 37 <laughs> like 36 um so i have so many friends around the world mm -hmm. I've, you know, I've spent at least a year of my life in Fiji, probably more in Tahiti. Um, yeah, just, it's good to keep up with everybody, especially this time in lives, in our lives when everyone's had a lot, most people have families mm -hmm. and stuff. They're less likely to come visit Hawaii in the winter mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. But it does I dig it for that. But as far as like, I don't give a shit if I'm popular. That's actually... One of the reasons why I like I'm a serial entrepreneur and I put so much time towards business, I would I would totally be happy with being the anonymous guy mm -hmm. that gets to live the lifestyle that he wants. Yeah. Totally fine with that. You you just do too many awesome things that it's recorded and people want to Well, see. I had to make a living out of it because <laughs> yeah. I wasn't like it's a chicken or the egg thing, right? You're like, how do I do the things I want and make a living at the same yeah. time? Not it's, be destitute and yeah. not own a place in my home where I grew up. Yeah. You know? No, I think if anybody is smart in business, they have social media. They, oh, they you have leverage to. It. They'd leverage it. Yep. Yeah. 100%. It's just, you know, just it's all on you how you use it. If you want to scroll endlessly, mindlessly on it for days, then that's up to you. <laughs> I'm also, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at it, though. Like, <laughs> I could, I know, I know how to leverage social media, and I don't fully do it because I just, like, I just don't want to be that guy you all the time. You don't hire somebody? No, I do everything. Dang. Everything. You don't want to hire somebody? To just do like... like just hire like some intern or some... Well, I, I got cool my boy Jesse Onover, who's fucking great, doing... Uh, he's he's doing my YouTube, like filming and editing. The Strike Missions? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, those are sick. Yeah, he's a, he's a one-man show over there. But um, yeah, Jesse's great, but that's the only thing. Mm. I do everything. I negotiate contracts. I do the business deals. I do... All the financial side. I do the travel booking. Busy life. 
Yeah. It's a lot of different things at once. Yeah. What does your wife think about your lifestyle? I mean, she obviously married you, but. Yeah. <laughs> Sucker, sucker's born every yeah, minute, right? Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, you knew what you were getting into. <laughs> no going back now. <laughs> to death do us part. Uh, I'm an officiant. Uh, I say those lines, yeah. so I know. <laughs> I know the weight those words carry. <laughs> um, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, what, what does your wife think about the oh, things you do? Yeah, she. I mean, she's like, she's very cool about it, to be honest. Like on the spectrum of the shit that I see my friends in similar line of work have to put up with sometimes. Like, mm -hmm. she's she's great. Um, obviously like the optics of it, sometimes it's like work, really work. You're going to keep <laughs> calling it work. Like you have to go on this trip. You, really? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> you know what you got into <laughs> <laughs> basically. But, but I do understand how the optics of it sometimes like, yes. Oh yeah. You're just bailing out, huh? You got to go on this hunt. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, do? being, being an entrepreneur, I, I understand it because Everything you're doing is contributing to your work, to your career. Yes. Right? So it's like one of those things. It's like unless you do it, you don't really truly understand it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I can see how the optics can get all. But she's cool with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, she gets to be a full-time homemaker mom, which is a full-time job. For Our real, job. Yeah. it is a full-time yeah. job. Yeah. Um, and I, I go out and drag dead things back and feed <laughs> the family and nice. try to keep the lights on. Yeah. So, so you, you, you do everything, like fishing, hunting, um, or like, what I mean by that is like you, you bring, you get your own food, you, you bring it home. Do you go to the grocery store? Yeah, we go to the grocery okay. store as well, but like primary protein sources mm -hmm. are, I would say 80% mm -hmm. stuff that I go and get. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Sustainability. That's something that we should all strive for. Yeah. <laughs> it makes you appreciate things a lot more. Definitely. You don't waste as much. Yes, yes. When I lived in Madagascar, that was the first time I realized like the convenience of you know, inconvenience, I guess, of not having grocery stores because I'm hours away from a supermarket. I, the only way to get food is go to the market, bargain for food. Mm -hmm. We don't have refrigerators, so we just got to cook everything fresh that day, you know? Yeah. So I was like, that was a, a very eye opening thing. And yeah. being able to turn on a tap and have water you trust. Exactly. Yeah. That's a big deal. Doing this and having hot water is mind blowing. Yes. I used to, we used to go spend a month at a time in islands, like in super remote Fiji. And you come back and you're just like, it's still fresh in your brain. You're like, oh my God, we can have a hot shower anytime we want. <laughs> can drink the water that's coming out yeah, of the tap. Exactly. There's water. Like I don't have to go do a hike with a bucket, mm -hmm. you know, or just not even like, it rains once in a week and he, everybody runs out and strips down. It's like, ah, this is my yeah. shower. I'm, I don't have salt crystals all over me for once. Yeah. Definitely. But it's, it's, a, it's about perspective. Yeah. I wish everybody could experience things like that. They'd have a, there'd be a lot less waste, yeah, a lot yeah. less grumbling. Yeah. Take a bucket bath for two years and see, <laughs> see how that goes. <laughs> yep. Get water from a well. <laughs> all right. Um, if you could be remembered for one thing, what would it be? Um... If I could be remembered for one thing, it would probably be being a good dad. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So st how old is your daughter? Uh, three. Three. Okay. Yeah. So er still early. Junior season yeah. of being a dad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> still How's rookie. it going? <laughs> it's going good. I mean, you learn a lot. Yeah. You, you realize how selfish you are mm. or how selfish your lifestyle has been up yeah. to that point, you know. And how selfless you have to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it, it's it's enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Like that 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 puts like it's difficult, but it's enjoyable, and that's kind of what I tell my friends. Because, um, dude, my people that I'm around are are pirates. You know, they're they're crazy people. They're very fringe. I I know them from this world that I'm in, and you know, some of them will ask me like, or some of the younger guys too, be like, you know oh, what's it like having a kid or, and stuff? Like, oh, it must be gnarly. And I'm like, you know, I used to, re I remember seeing my buddies have kids and you're like, come on, let's go do this thing or let's do this trip. And they're like, oh, I can't do it. I'm like, God, that sounds like it sucks. Um, but also I was like, okay, what, what pursuit do you love that you do regularly that is easy? Mm -hmm. And like, 
nothing. It's all got an element of danger, risk. It's not easy. You have to apply yourself. You have to get beat down and come back up. I'm like, well, that's what being a dad is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, But it's rewarding on a level that's so much deeper than any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it's challenging. It's hard. Mm -hmm. But if it was easy, probably wouldn't be interested. Yeah, yeah. You and know? you like the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> it's self-development. It's like, yeah. God, the, the crazy thing is, is how it's never explained to you is like when you have your first kid, you're both learning at the same time, the kid and you. You're yeah. like, fit, it, it, there's no like practice trial run really. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, what is this world? <laughs> what, what is this body? <laughs> what? They have yeah. no idea that they're like with a total rookie that's learning it yeah. as they go. That's, it's a good thing they don't know. Yeah, as I get older, I, re <laughs> I realize that, and I mentioned it before in the podcast, like my parents had me at the age I'm at right now. I don't have any kids. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to be a parent. I don't know. I barely know what I'm doing. So being easier on our parents, realizing the point we are in our lives, like they were in that position too. Like they didn't know what they were doing. No, <laughs> they didn't. Yeah, and you <laughs> thought they did. They have exactly. all the answers. Yeah. And now, you, now when I look back and I see old photos, I'm like, oh my God. They're kids. Yeah. Like. It's crazy how that. Figuring it out. Another one of those dynamic shifts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, so what what are your future goals? What's next? Any big things coming up? Um, future goals. So I'm leaving tonight. I actually got a pack. Oh, yeah. Um, Thanks for rushing down so, here. I appreciate it. Yeah, all good. <laughs> um, uh, it's archery elk season in Colorado. So I go Ooh, every nice. year I go for for elk in the mountains. Hopefully that works out. So that's a near term goal. Um, besides that is just, uh, working on these businesses that I have. And, um, I'm actually looking at some farmland. Mm. So I'll probably, I'm diving into like farming. Big Island. No, <laughs> I was looking on Big Island. <laughs> Michael has a lot got, behind I, his house. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I got to make more money again because I just spent all my money <laughs> on this, um, it's definitely on the list, but, uh, yeah, just want to start making food, mm. you know, making food and setting stuff up for the future, mm -hmm. putting, putting trees in the ground, Love getting it, getting ahead of it. Cool. Yeah. Good luck with that. I'm excited to see what, what comes next. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So this is the moment everyone is waiting for. What is your life hack? My life hack is... is cutting the second guessing and talking yourself out of things or putting off things that you know you need to do and just like just flipping a switch like okay now it's happening now like something that you've been telling yourself forever like for instance just weird example like i remember one day i was like i've been looking at the peak of mount kaal my whole life i've never been up there mm. We're going now. Like you have to do those things because time just goes by and you, you'll look back and it's a decade later or maybe you never come back to it. Like that, if it's important to you if, and it feels like something you want to do, start now. Mm -hmm. No excuse. Don't give yourself enough time to make excuses. Don't let people around you talk you out of it. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Love it. He said it, not Nike. Just do it. Ah, shoot, man! I fully stepped into that one. <laughs> you ever you ever watched Office? Um, yeah, I have. <laughs> There's uh, the uh, Wayne Gretzky Green Wayne Gretzky quote where it's like, um, you miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take, Wayne Gretzky, and then underneath that is Michael Scott. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, just do it, Nike. Under that. Mark Healy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's basically You're welcome, your guys. <laughs> so I'm basically a genius. I'll be doing some uh, speaking <laughs> seminars. Yes, hire him. <laughs> <laughs> Prestige Worldwide. <laughs> it's my new company. Yes. <laughs> so funny. Love that movie. <laughs> All right. So I just got top five rapid fire questions. Okay. Favorite post surf snack or meal? Um. Oh, that's a hard one. I love a good 
acai bowl. I was going to say acai mm. bowl. Mm-hmm. Pupakea Grill has the best acai bowl. I've never had it from there. It's I've, so I've good. Been to, my girlfriend lives at Sunset, so I've been to the one past, past like going towards the like, year. I don't know what it's called, like Rainbow. Um, Sunrise Shack? No, not Sunrise Shack. It's a little further. Um, hmm. I don't know. I like that one because for the, the ratio to the price, it's, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't remember the name, but oh, yeah, a good acai bowl. Love it. All right. Uh, favorite travel spot? Um, Fiji. Mm, for the reasons you mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What about um, your, the spot you want to, the first spot you want to take your daughter to? Mm. Next trip, Fiji. <laughs> She's got to go meet all the Fijian aunties over there I haven't seen that okay. I basically grew up with. That's fair. All right. Favorite movie? Mm. Favorite movie, Big Lebowski. Mm. Okay. Nice. Uh, favorite food to cook? Um, Axis Deer French Cut Rib Racks. Oof. Where, where do you get that Molokai? Um, <laughs> either there, uh, Lanai or Maui. Mm. Yeah, I haven't been to... The bounce around. What, yeah. Whatever friend can go hunting, basically. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey. <laughs> All right, I had my, my last question was favorite dream vacation, but I feel like you're going to say uh, Fiji. <laughs> favorite dream vacation? <laughs> That's not it Fiji. Would ha- it would have to be something new. Um, yeah. I've been looking at the Azores a bit. Azores look really cool. I've never been there. What do you want to do there? Just go hang out. Every, every single person that I... I've I've just heard this comment too many times. They're like, it's like the Atlantic Hawaii. It's so similar. Mm. You know, um, a lot of the the Portuguese that ended up in Hawaii came from Azores. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. My family. <laughs> yeah, or my Portuguese side. Yeah, that's, nice. That's cool. Azorian. Yeah. How do you, how would you say that? Yeah, Azorian. Azores. I don't know. Azores. The Azores, maybe. Yeah. No, but the people from there. Yeah, maybe, maybe they're yeah. called Azores. Azores. I don't know. Azordians. <laughs> Azordians. <laughs> hey, that could go on your um, Esquire, Reverend Azordian. <laughs> Azordian. That's funny. All right, well, um, where can we find you? What's your social media? Uh, my social media is Instagram, Healy Water Ops. And then I'm on YouTube. I got Strike Missions where we go. And basically when the time's right and everything's lining up, we go diving, surfing, hunting, whatever. Everything. Yeah, go check it out. It's really cool. Very, very entertaining. Get your heart pumping. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, that's all we got. I just want to say mahalo for coming on and taking the time out of your day to talk stories. Uh, it's cool to get to know the other people that um, my brother and sister-in-law hang out with and they talk so highly of, you know. Oh, so, they're um, sweet. Um, yeah, super stoked. Great people. We, we got to do this, yeah. <laughs> right on. Great meeting you again. And <laughs> thanks for having me. Yes. Mahalo, Mark, for joining us on the Hawaiiverse podcast. Check us out on Hawaiiverse.com, the best place to support local. Spread aloha, be kind to one another, and mahalo for listening to us today. New episodes every Thursday, so make sure you follow us and leave a review. I'm your host, Kamaka, and you'll hear me next time on the Hawaiiverse podcast. Ahui ho. Mm-hmm.